more machine embroidery. Can you ever get too much of something like this? I don't think so. Good morning everybody and welcome to my weekly vlog for Bland Designs and today is vlog number 207 and it's Monday March the 8th 2021 and about 362 days of COVID for me which means that it has been pretty much a year. What was I doing a year ago? Hmm, A year ago I was at a physical retreat, a retreat for quilting through Ultimate Sewing and I remember it was cold, it was snowy where we went, and we had heard about COVID, but we really had no idea what the next 12 months were gonna have in store for us. So yeah, those were nicer times back then, but nicer times are on the horizon again, possibly, we'll see. By the way, there's probably a little noise in the background because I've got my 3D printer going, making a couple of things. So just ignore the sound of it. Okay, so let's uh, take a look at what you saw in the teaser, which was my latest uh, freestanding lace and applique combination embroidery. And I made a lighthouse and here it is right here. And I think it turned out pretty cool. You know, I love these kind of things. I, I make them all the time. I did a whole bunch of different types of things at Christmas time. And uh, my goal this year is to carry on uh, making more of these. And there are some buildings I can get. There's actually a snow village. It's quite expensive if you were to buy all the pieces at once, like well over $500. But I might buy a piece here and there and go from there and work up to something. I don't know. Like, do I need a, a little village made out of embroidery stuff? Not really. I have a ceramic one upstairs in my dining room. It's been there for years and years and years. Um, it's those Department 56, if you know what those are, buildings and things. And um, yeah, <laughs> do I need another dust collector? I probably don't need it, but do I want one? Yeah, I do. So, Anyways, this turned out quite kind of nice. You can't really see it here in the video. There is a little tea light down inside of it. Now, this tea light has been going for about three days uh, on the battery that was already in it. I found it in the back of a drawer. Um, so I'm just seeing how long uh, the battery that's in it will last um, because it's a bit of a pain in the butt to have to change it all the time if you don't have to. I mean, this whole top comes right off. That's not the problem. But you know, it would be nice if it was on a switch, but it's not on a switch. And, you know, if I got one of those remote control tea lights kind of a thing, which you can get, um, you got to remember to turn it on. And I'm not good at that. So anyways, we'll just see how how this works out. So anyways, I think it's really quite cute. Uh, the windows are made from organza. And if you look, look closely at them, the organza I had had little stars on it. Um, and I thought that was kind of a cute thing for a lighthouse. Um, there is one mistake on this, but you would never know. And the mistake is these panels that are here with the black in the center. Well, there are six of them in total. Three of them are supposed to have where you see the black strip now, and then three of them are supposed to be the opposite. So like a white stripe in the, in the center part here. And what that would have made is it would look like it was a spiral all the way around. But I realized too late that I had not done that and I thought, well, big deal. Who's going to know except me and now you? Okay, so that's one thing I was working on. Another thing I was working on, um, these are going to be gifts and I'm not going to say to who, but really they have something to do with the retreat. And uh, I made mug rugs. And you can see on here, it's got a sewing machine on it and it says March 2021 when the retreat is. And over here, a little closer for you it says the idiot quilter and if you don't know what a mug rug is it's just as it says this sits on wherever and you put your coffee cup or your drink or whatever on top of it and these are washable so that's a good thing because if you're like me you'll probably slop something on it so i made a bunch of those i also made some pin cushions and again i had shown you the base of these because i had done them in the 3d printer and now i've got them finished and i dressed them up with some embroidered butterflies 
and you can see the tops. I found this really pretty fabric in my stash. Put that in there and I got some pins in it and they're ready to go. And I made a, uh, more of these as well. And I might make a few more in the future, just keep them on hand as little simple hostess gifts or something like that. Um, so that's what I've been up to. And um, yeah, I've been doing a few other things on the 3D printer, but we'll come to that when we get to the segment on the 3D corner. Uh, so that takes us to YouTube channel of the week. Now this one is for the people who are into 3D printing or are thinking about getting into 3D printing, but I highly recommend, especially if you're just getting into 3D printing, that you watch some of the videos by these guys. They're Canadian um, as well, which is a bonus as far as I'm concerned. And they really genuinely know what they're talking about. So check this out. This week's YouTube channel is one that has to do with 3D printing. And if you're new to 3D printing, you're going to find this really helpful. It's called The First Layer and it's by two guys that are Canadian. And they really are, in my opinion, experts about 3D printing with any machine. Uh, they give you tips and tricks and they have a weekly uh, live show where they answer all kinds of questions about setting up your printer, about getting the best uh, models printed, all of that kind of stuff. I find it very, very useful. So if you're new to 3D printing, or even if you have had a 3D printer for quite a while, I think you should check out the first layer. So the link for the first layer is in the show notes below. There is a link to Stephen and Walter Live, and I kind of did a little teaser yesterday in the title of Stephen and Walter Live, said new location, like as if we were moving somewhere. Well, we did move somewhere within our house. We're looking for the ideal spot for doing the Stephen and Walter Live. Now, for a long, long time, we were doing it. That thing is loud today. Jeez, hope that's not coming up too much on here. Um... I'll just talk louder. So uh, we're always looking for the ideal location to do Stephen and Walter live. And a lot of it has to do with lighting. And, you know, so we, we tried it in my sewing room. Uh, that's better. But the lighting is still a bit of a problem in there. So we decided to do it in Walter's sewing room yesterday. Um, a little better. Still some issues with lighting. But the biggest problem we're having right now is having a setup where we can see people's comments and make it look like we're looking at you, like I am right now, okay? Because what happens is we will have our iPads with us and we'll be constantly looking down at our iPads to see what the comments are. So we're doing this all the time. And that gets annoying for you, know, for you and for us. So we're gonna try a different setup next week. And we're going to try it from my main computer in my craft room. Um, the reason we've never really done it from that one before was because the older computer I had couldn't handle, for some reason, YouTube Lives. I don't know why, it just couldn't. But the new one can. So we're looking at the setup for that. The, th the main thing is you don't want to have to spend an hour before the uh, live rearranging equipment you want something that you can go basically plug and play so i'm still working on that we'll see what happens um and yeah there is a the latest episode uh well latest as in last tuesday of the idiot quilter on their episode 104 okay so that takes me to what's pissing me off this week have you ever felt that you were just part of a really large government or world government experiment during COVID. I don't want to sound like a conspiracy, conspiracy theorist or anything like that, all right? However, there are some things I'm starting to question, at least from the way things are being handled here in my province of Ontario. Our Ontario government has botched this whole thing. And Given who the leader is of the um, party, of the Conservative Party that's running Ontario right now, I don't have, I, this is not a surprise, okay? Because he's an idiot, all right? He's kind of like a mini Trump in some ways. Not near as extreme, but the thought processes that he has, or, well, does he think? I don't know. Does his government think? I don't know. They can't get these vaccines out 
in an efficient way. And then what they do is they throw blame on the federal government. Well, yeah, there is blame to be had by the federal government. Generally speaking, any of the governments in the world, if you watch the news, those in North America, over in the UK, in other parts, have all done a stinking job on this. Probably the one exception to this is probably New Zealand and Australia. They've handled this, from what I have seen in the reports, pretty good. I mean, someone gets COVID, they shut everything down. Now, you might think that's extreme, but I think it's a great idea. That's what we should be doing in Ontario. No, no, no. We're just playing to the businesses. Yeah, I know. That's a conversation all on its own, and we've heard the conversation. And I feel sorry for the, the businesses, the mom and pops, and the whole bit. But, you know, if I have to pick between living and buying something from you, guess what wins? But I think we're being experimented on. Look at the vaccines now. What do we got in Ontario? We have three, or in Canada, three vaccines that have been approved by Health Canada. And there's another one, the Johnson & Johnson one, is, is approved now, I think. Um, and it's going to be distributed as well. Well, you might say, great, wonderful. We have all these vaccines now, and our country has ordered more than enough vaccines. So they tell us. Not really sure if I believe that either. However... They talk about the, and I'm not going to try to say the word in its proper form, but you know how effective these are. The Johnson & Johnson one is like 65% or something like that, but you only need one shot of it. Um, yeah, okay, what does that mean? Now, they come on the news and they tell you what that means. And it doesn't mean like it's only going to give you 65% protection because it depends on this, it depends on that, and all these kinds of things. Yeah, it's all gobbledygook. They purposely explain everything in such a garbled mess to keep us confused. Also, I don't know if they know what they're talking about. You know, medical science really is not that far out of the Middle Ages, if you really think about it. Um, medical science is constantly experimenting. They call it research. I call it experimenting. And they're experimenting on people. And COVID vaccines are no different. And the way that they're distributing is no different. We are just guinea pigs. We're pawns in all of this at the whims of whatever the experts are telling the government to do. Yeah, great experts. They went to the Sick Kid Hospital here in Toronto, which has a great world reputation. And according to the government, now I don't believe this totally, Sick kids said, sure, send the kids back to school. It's not a problem. It's better for them. It's good for their mental health. Don't worry about their physical health. Just send them back to school. And you know how I feel about that. Yeah, no. Those little disease bags back in school, you're just asking for trouble. Um, every day we see statistics out there about, you know, in our area, it's all divided up into regions and that, and how many new cases and how many deaths, unfortunately. And, but then they have these other numbers, like how many, how many um, people have been tested in a given day, how many tests have not yet been resolved, which I'm not sure what that means. Then there's the daily average, rolling average, and then there's the positivity average, and it's 1.97 or 2.3 one or whatever they throw all these numbers at us they mean nothing may mean nothing we all know that statistics can be manipulated by whoever is putting them out there for whatever reasons they want to use so i take all of those numbers with a grain of salt so back to the vaccines apparently our ontario government wasted 1500 shots they went past the expiry date or something uh, the news, the media was trying to claim it was part of the, the inefficiency of our government. You don't know what they're doing. And I believe that. I mean, yes, the me media spins things, but I do believe that, that they haven't got a bloody clue. I mean, our government in Ontario had to bring in the military to look after logistics. And I've said this before. What does the government, what does the, uh, the military know about moving vaccines? They might know something about moving troops and, and moving guns, but what about vaccines? I have no faith in the military either. I mean, military intelligence is an oxymoron as far as I'm concerned. So we've got doctors who are quacks and we've got idiots in the military and we've got arseholes in the government. And this 
is what is control controlling us and whether or not we're going to get a vaccine. Add into that mix the research being done the by the pharmaceutical companies to find the cure or the vaccine for all of this. Um, yeah, it is well known fact that next to banks, the pharmaceutical companies are making lots and lots and lots of money uh, providing us with all kinds of chemicals that are supposed to save us from a world of aches and pains. Yeah, right. What's their interest in doing this? Are they doing it for humanitarian reasons? No, if they were doing it for humanitarian reasons, they wouldn't be charging for it. Oh yeah, they're charging for this vaccine. Now you're going to say, well, yeah, they need the money in order to carry on with the research and to develop these things. Nothing's free. Exactly. You're right. But it's a question of how much they need to develop these and how much more they're making. And I can guarantee you that they're not just making a couple of pennies extra on each vial of the vaccine. They're making a lot more than that because pharmaceutical companies are big, big business. So can we trust them when they come out and say, yes, yes, our drug is 95% effective or, and, and then what they're saying is, you know, we know with the exception of the Johnson and Johnson one, we need two shots from any one of these vaccines. Okay, now originally they said it was a three week span between the first shot and the second shot. Well, now our government is saying that, well, no, uh, upon further investigation, um, you, we can go up to four months between the two shots. And that way, their justification is, well, we can get the first shot into more arms because, you know, we're not having to hold back on the second shot. So, and we have more drugs coming. We have more vaccines coming. We keep hearing that. Any day now, more vaccines are coming. Um, but now it's gone to four months. Hmm. Three weeks, four months. Big jump. Who's right about that? You mean to tell me they didn't know that when they were first developing this? And then they were saying too that, oh, well, they could get an extra shot out of each vial. So it'll go even further now. They, they found they were, um, I guess, shooting people up with too much of the drug. I don't know. But it keeps changing every day. And you know who the people are that are being manipulated? Us. We're the guinea pigs for all of this. Is there a solution? Yeah, there is. This is a thing. And I don't think I'm oversimplifying it. You have X amount of drugs. They're coming on X amount of date. You set up X amount site and you set up a procedure where people can book their appointment. You make it easy for them to do it. Sure, they're going with the 80 year olds and up right now fine no problem with that whatsoever but let's remember the 80 year olds and up may not be as comfortable with computer technology which is the way they need to book it so they do need some assistance what assistance has the government put in place for those people they're telling people if you've got elderly relatives you know you should step up and get them there well yeah i think you should no matter what because it's just not a question that they might have a little bit of problem with the technology. They might actually have some problem getting to the injection sites. In our area, they've put an injection site way far away from the, where the vast majority of the 80 year olds and plus live. So these people, and they say, well, it's on the bus route. Well, yeah, maybe an 80 year old doesn't have a problem negotiating the bus system. Some don't, some do. So why can't they put in a, uh, a system whereby, I mean, we have census records in every city, every town. Those records show the birth date of people. All they have to do is go into their computer, have it pull up all the names of people that are 80 plus, get their addresses and set up a shuttle service for them. Yes, it will take a little time and yes, it will take some manpower for that. But you want to know something? If you call for volunteers to make phone calls, to knock on doors, to set things up with these people, you'll get volunteers. 
There's been people doing volunteer uh, things throughout this uh, pandemic. There'll be volunteers, you can do it. But for some reason, these ideas, these things, now I'm not saying I have all the ideas and I know maybe I have oversimplified it, but it seems to me you go with the most direct route to get these vaccines to people. But everybody probably has to argue about how it has to be done. There's too, probably too many personalities at working on this. There's too many people who want to micromanage this whole system. And who suffers from it? Us, the guinea pigs. We just go get in our cage and squeal away and eat our pellets or whatever as we wait for the vaccine. So, yeah, the government has botched this. The medical community has botched this. I mean, just as an aside, my doctor's office called up and said that, yeah, the doctor wanted us to go get our blood tested. Now, in the old days, back pre-COVID, uh, we'd go and see our doctor every three months. Um, Walter has some things where he that's more important for him than it is for me, but this doctor, she's very good, and I'm a relatively new patient for her. So, yeah, she puts me on the same schedule as Walter. Fine. It was nice that her doc that she's keeping you know tabs on us I guess but we have to go to a clinic to get our blood done so we were looking at how they're running the clinic and this is really COVID safe so what you do is you go online for the clinic where you want to do this um, you register I guess Walter's been looking after it so I haven't really looked at this yet I'm just going by what he's told me and I'm sure I've left something out and he will correct me on Stephen and Walter live about this but basically the way I read it is you go online and it tells you has all the clinics where you can get your blood work done and it tells you what the waiting time is so I guess you either check in online or you go to that clinic you check in they give you a number and you go out and sit in your car and wait until you get called to go and have the blood test done um that's fine have those people that are taking my blood the technicians have they all had their covid shots yet their vaccine are they considered frontline workers to date here in ontario not all the frontline workers have had the vaccine yet so I have my doubts. So I'm going into a clinic, I'm wearing my mask, but we are not going to be social distanced from the technician because unless they have a needle that's six feet long, <laughs> they have to get right in there, right? So, you know, I don't know. It, it's, we're guinea pigs for all of this. And we're, I guess the bottom line for me is the inefficiency of how this has all been handled and you know something this time last year our government stated that we're prepared for whatever this thing throws at us because we went through SARS and so we learned a lot from that when that happened and we're well prepared uh yeah really no I don't think you learned anything um one of our governments, one of our federal governments, decided that drugs did not need to be produ produced in Canada anymore and basically we don't have anybody that can produce the drug, the vaccine here in Canada. Oh, that was good thinking. And it was probably all governed by the almighty dollar because, let's face it, that's what it is. It all comes down to dollars and cents. Not to human lives, to dollars and cents. So, great. I guess we're going to enjoy our little cages. We've been in the little cages now for almost a year um, and they've been feeding us crap through all of this and yeah, time will see which guinea pigs survive the experiment. Okay, so that takes us to product reviews and after that I need some coffee. I'm just going to take a look over at my printer to make sure I'm not getting like a hairy thing growing on there. No, it's good. Everything's good. Uh, if you're curious, I'm printing out a couple of little clips for mounting my uh, webcams. Um, I'm, I'm trying to, to, as I told you earlier, I'm trying to get things set up that are the most efficient 
we're just talking about efficiency, um, for the retreat. And uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. But uh, yeah, so that's what these are printing out. Okay, I digress as usual. So what have I got new? Well, I bought some new filament. And I'm going to show you what that filament looks like because it's a special kind. But I'm going to save that for the 3D corner. But the other thing I want to show you is this little item. And you're going to say, what is this with the squiggly lines? This is a quilting ruler, a template. I bought it on Amazon. I've seen there's different designs of this. This is called a meander, which is a very common free motion quilting design on a quilt. And the reason I bought it is because I'm not good at doing this stuff in free motion. I need a guide. So what you do is you have a special foot. I have it for my sewing machine for ruler work. It's basically a, a foot that is about a quarter inch in height. And what you do is you place this on your quilt, put your foot in here. It'll fit exactly in here and you just move your quilt and this around and you'll get this design. And then when you come to the end of that, you just turn this another way and carry on. I'm going to try it. I've tried it on a small sample already this week and yeah, it does work. So the real test is how does it work out when you're doing a full size quilt? So I am going to try and use this on one of my UFOs, um, which means unfinished object um, this week. So I'll let you know if this works well. I am going to invest in some of the other designs too, but we'll see. We'll check this one out first. Were these expensive? Well, it ran me about $18 on Amazon. Um, so we'll see. Um, right now I can tell you, I wish they were a little thicker because when you get into these inside pieces, you do have to be careful because you see what it's doing right here. It's rising up and your foot can go under it. And that kind of kills the purpose. But I found if I keep to the outside portion as I go around and keep my hand sort of down on these parts that might pop up, then I'm okay. So that's why I did the sample one to see, to get the feel for this. So we'll see how this works out. The quilt I'm going to do it on, if I screw it up a little bit, it's not going to really matter because it was basically a quilt I did from scraps at some point in time. So it can be experimented on. It can be my guinea pig. Okay. So that's all that I've bought in the last week. Um, so that takes us to um, stories about my grandmother, my continuing series here. Now, last week I told you about the pancake incident. Well, I, I sort of have a continuation of that, but it's not about pancakes. As I mentioned to you, my grandmother um, was heavily influenced by what she saw on TV. And she was always experimenting. My grandmother loved to experiment uh, with things. She loved to experiment on her grandchildren too. Hmm, she should work for our government. Well, she's dead, so she can't. But um, she had some quirks about food as kids. For example, there was one year, for some reason, I don't remember what the reason was, but we were at my grandmother's for Halloween. So we went trick-or-treating in the town she lived in. Now, of course, the rule in my family about Halloween candy, which I think is a good rule, and I think a lot of parents have this rule even to this day, is you do not eat any of that candy until you get it home and, you know, my parents had inspected the candy to make sure that everything was safe. Now, it was a small town. The chances were pretty slim that you were going to find some bad things in your candy bag. However, that was the rule. I suspect that a lot of times it was my parents went through to find the stuff they liked and sort of, oh yeah, yeah. don't eat that. That's not good for you. <laughs> it's candy. It's not good for you no matter what. But anyways, um, so my grandmother was in charge of this and she went through it all. And my grandmother had this thing about chocolate bars. Her favorite chocolate bar, which in her mind was a healthy candy, was Jersey Milk. I think they were made by Nielsen's at the time was a company or Cadbury. I'm not even sure if you can buy them anymore. I, I went looking for them some time ago and I don't think I found them. So I think they stopped making them. But what convinced my grandmother that these were the best chocolate bars is because they were called milk chocolate. So the word milk got her right there. It's chocolate. The amount of milk that was probably in that chocolate was probably not enough to make any difference in terms of your daily consumption of 
vitamins or whatever. But for my grandmother, that meant that was the best chocolate. And she always had Jersey milk chocolate bars on hand in her home at the time. So if you got a Jersey milk chocolate bar in the Halloween candy, that was good. That was set aside in the good pile. And then she went through other things. Now, if you came across things like what we call in Canada rockets, I think this is what Americans call Smarties. They're the little candies in the roll. They're in multiple colors. And they basically are powdered sugar compressed into what looks like a pill. Well, she wasn't so sure about those because was it a question of the fact that they were pure sugar, refined sugar? No, that wasn't a problem for my grandmother. Sugar, good. Milk, good. Chocolate, good. But it's the wrapping. Because you know, those were wrapped in cellophane and twisted at the ends. Now somebody could get in there and do something horrible with it. Also, they look like pills. They look like drugs. Are they candy or are those drugs? So those went in the bad pile. But as she's sifting through all of this, she comes across gumballs, little gumballs, okay? And you know, the, those in those days, I guess they probably still make gumball balls, the kind of thing they used to have in those penny um, machines, you know, in the grocery stores and in shopping malls and things, you know, kids always wanted, you know, give me a penny, give me, a, and they went up to a nickel and a dime, a quarter, and you don't see a lot of those today. Um, and if you do, they don't really have candy in them. I think they have like little toys in little plastic containers or something. They probably cost you two bucks. But anyways, gumballs. And they're colored. Well, my grandmother, she didn't think gum was a, actually a bad thing to have. Just don't ever swallow it. Oh God, no, because you swallow it, it stayed in your, gu in your stomach forever. My grandmother wasn't the only one that used to tell that tale. Teachers used to tell kids that tale too. I think it was just a made up story to get kids so they wouldn't be eating gum in class and sticking it to the underside of the desk. But my grandmother decided that those went in the maybe pile. Now, she felt she could save those for us to be, with some alteration, they could end up in the good pile. What was my grandmother's alteration to this? She took all the gumballs and a big cup of water, put them all in the cup of water, and soaked all the coloring off the gumballs. Now, her theory was, that was dye, and that's not good for you. And you know, I want to know something, quite frankly, she's probably right. Because, you know, what was that, red dye number two or something that was supposed to be carcinogenic and things like that. So she soaked all our gumballs. So we had white gumballs. All the color came off. She dried them all and they were now in our good pile. So we were eating white gumballs. Actually, it didn't matter to me so much because I have never liked gum. I don't chew gum. I never ever have. I don't know why. My brother and sister liked it okay, but not me. To this day, I don't chew gum. Just don't. I think it might be the cheapness in me. When I used to buy penny candy, gum was always a little bit more expensive. I could get more bang for my buck buying other stuff than gum. And to me, gum was a waste because you, you chewed it and spit it out and, and the flavor didn't last long. I don't know, that's weird logic, I think. But that was how I thought as a kid and so I don't eat gum. So that was one of the weird things she did with food. But one of the things, and we loved this as a kid that she did with food, not so weird but very extreme, kind of like the pancakes. Ice cream sundaes. My grandmother always had ice cream in her house. To this day, I love ice cream. I purposely, we buy ice cream. Actually, during COVID, for some reason, Walter's gotten into making ice cream cones for us. Um, I wait till he suggests if we want ice cream. Like he'll say, do you want an ice cream cone? And I'll go, sure and he'll make them. Uh, I don't go to it on purpose because I would sit down and I have done this and the whole container of ice cream with a spoon and I'll just shovel it in. And uh, yeah, it, you know how many calories are in that. So I don't, but I do love ice cream. Any flavor, doesn't matter. If I have to, I'll eat vanilla. 
when there's a whole rainbow of flavors out there why eat just vanilla but that was my father you asked my father what his favorite uh, type of ice cream was or what he wanted for ice cream flavor vanilla he did later in his life get a little exotic and go for french vanilla but i'll eat any kind of ice cream so my grandmother always had this on tap so she'd want to make us a sundae she'd call it well her sundaes were actually banana splits my grandmother loved a banana split in fact she loved banana splits so much that she loved Dairy Queen and so on the occasion when we'd go to Dairy Queen and in those days Dairy Queen had the plastic containers and the plastic containers had the little end on them that had the little dipped cone kind of thing swirl on the end and you got the little plastic spoons that had the same design on the end of those she'd save those she'd bring them home she'd wash them all out and when we had a Sunday at my grandmother's she would get out the Dairy Queen plastic dishes I guess she was making it special right and as kids it was special to us so this is how my grandmother made an ice cream sundae first of all she'd round up her ingredients she'd go through her cupboards and her fridge and pull out whatever she could find so she'd have the ice cream of course she always had a wide variety of sauces chocolate butterscotch strawberry whatever was there those came out on the kitchen table she would have sprinkles she would have raisins um, to put on top of it she'd have shredded coconut she'd even use some forms of cereal if she was hard pressed for uh, more fruit to put on it she'd always use bananas she would find other fruit that she'd slice up and throw on that she would even use jams and preserves on top of that and of course to top it all off you had to have a gallon of whipped cream sprayed on the top of it and my grandmother always had which I found funny with the way my grandmother was about food. She always had a can of Ready Whip in her fridge. And that's that spray um, whipped cream. That was something my mother seldom had in her refrigerator. My mother, if we had whipped cream on anything, she would buy a container of whipped cream and whip it herself. But my grandmother always had a can of this Ready Whip. And so she would... She didn't put a dollop. She basically buried everything that was already in a dish. Now, you're talking. <laughs> this thing is overflowing. I mean, it's up to here on the dish with ice cream. In fact, there's so much sauce and everything else running on to the top of it. She would put that little plastic Dairy Queen thing, because it's overflowing, onto a plate. So you didn't waste anything. You got it all there. And then top it all off with a maraschino cherry bang oh did I mention chopped nuts yeah there were chopped nuts of course there were chopped nuts in those days nobody worried about uh, peanut allergies we never had them as kids so there was no question of that so there you go now these were fantastic and if you were to go into an ice cream place a place that makes these kind of things you would pay premium price for something like this because they would probably call it the Olympian or the tower of cream or something like that you know it would feed 10 people at your table no this was she made each one of us each one of us kids one of these funny thing is i've never gotten sick of ice cream sundaes you think i would because were these sweet oh yeah like make your teeth ache sweet but as kids we absolutely loved it of course when my grandmother did these kind of food extravaganzas, my parents were nowhere around. So talking about experimenting today, as soon as my parents left, they had friends and relatives and that, and they were young, very young, uh, when I'm talking about this. So they'd be in their 20s, late 20s. They were going out partying, sort of, whatever, somebody's house kind of a thing. And so we were at my grandmother's. As soon as my parents left, my grandmother would look at us and go, who wants ice cream? Yes, grandma. We'd be waiting for it because we knew it was coming. And yeah. So my parents never witnessed these ice cream sundaes because my grandmother did it when they weren't around. Sneaky, sneaky, sneaky. Um, 
but just another reason why I love my grandmother. But my grandmother's philosophy about food was you had to enjoy it. There was no question of her worried about our physical well-being in terms of, you know, you want to get fat and that kind of stuff. But in those days, we were kids. We ran around, we played outside, we did all kinds of things. We wore it off. Today, no, there'd be all kinds of worries about that, you know, juvenile di diabetes, whatever, diabetes one, two, uh, giving to kids, um, allergies to certain food products like nuts. Yeah, no, my grandmother never worried about that. The more ice cream, the more sauce, the better it was. Yeah, I kind of miss those days. My waistline doesn't. Okay, so that takes us to the 3D corner. And uh, of course, you already saw the pin cushions, and I might be making some more of those. Um, I did print one of these out because those of you that are in 3D printing know what it is. this is. It's a temperature tower. And basically the idea is, you can see there's these numbers up the side. That's how hot your filament is coming out at. And it does this little tower thing and makes these little bridges. They call them bridges across. And the idea here is to take a, a new filament that you've never used before, print one of these out, and you look at which, which one of these sections looks the best, and that's the temperature you should be printing at. So I did it for this particular filament, and I think 200 is what looked the best on here. Um, I probably should do this on another new filament that I've bought, and I probably will, but I haven't done that yet. So that's a tool that basically you use in 3D printing. Um, and speaking of tools, I bought some other tools. Okay. This thing. It's a scraper. It's a putty knife. Bought it at the dollar store, but it has a nice edge to it. Getting your prints off the plate can be at times tricky. They can stick very well. Uh, if that's the case, well, one, I find if I let it cool right down, don't rush the process, you can usually just snap it off the plate. But sometimes you can't. So sometimes you need to sort of get a little bit under it, and it's sort of like suction. And if you can get under just the edge of it and pry it up a bit, uh, then it'll usually pop off. And sometimes you just go jab, jab, jab <laughs> underneath with this and that'll make it come off too and also make it fly across the room. Um, but this is dandy. This works really well. Now this cost me more than a dollar. It's got the price takes on. It was $3 at Dollarama. It, they call it dollar, dollar plus now. <laughs> yeah, because there's very few things in the dollar store that's a dollar, at least here. So I got that, and another tool was one at the dollar store. It's a silicone brush, but you'll notice this one, I've cut it down a little bit. And apparently, I saw this on a video, this is really good for cleaning off what you call the hot end. It's the nozzle where the filament comes through. Well, the thing is, you can get what they call boogers. <laughs> yeah, boogers, uh, which are little knobs of the filament stuck to your nozzle underneath and that's not good you want to get those off and you can sort of pick them off when it's cool um, but this does a nice job you just go boom 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 underneath the, the nozzle and it's nice and soft it won't damage but it's stiff enough by cutting off the extra length uh, that it gets those boogers right off so if you're new into 3d printing i highly recommend these two tools go to your dollar store to get them um, i've also been making little flower pots for Walter wants to start up. Uh, we bought a bunch of seeds and we're going to do some container gardening again this summer because it was so successful last year. Um, we're going to extend it, make it bigger, but Walter bought some seeds to get started. So I said, I can make you little seed starter cups. And so I've made a whole bunch of these. These don't take long to print. Um, a couple of hours and I get five or so out of them. So I made a pile of them. There's, these are three. And they're stackable. So I made that. Now I said I also bought some new filament. Filament is called PLA for the most part. That's the most common filament from what I'm finding. But there are other types and they have different properties. And one of those is called PETG, PETG. Um, and it's basically a uh, type of filament that's a little stronger than PLA but you need to have different temperature settings 
uh, to use it. So I was, did a little experiment and I created another one of those little pots. But you notice this one? I bought this actually, it was a mistake. I thought I was buying PLA. I saw the color, it said it was translucent blue. And it is, so you can kind of see through it. Um, and I, I love the color. Um, then when I got it, I realized it was PETG. And I thought, well, I've never used that before. Time to think outside of the box and try it. And it worked very well. I had no problems with it. So this is the only thing that I, well, actually it's not. This is the first thing I printed in the PETG. Um, so I printed Walter another thread stand holder. Now, you know, I printed him ones out of regular PLA a week or so ago, and the little prongs have a tendency to just drop off because it's not very strong, it's PLA. So I thought if I make one for him out of this, it might hold up better. And uh, he hasn't mounted it yet, hasn't really used it, so I don't know, but I did print him one out of that. But I just, the color alone, I, I love the color, I love the shine that's on this. So I am going to print some other things with this. As I said, I just got it on the weekend. So I will be experimenting more with this. and. I may buy if the experiments work out okay. This word experiments coming up a lot today in this video. This should it be the theme? Experiments. Um, but as I was saying, um, if I, I do a few more experiments with this one and if those turn out okay, I may invest in a few more uh, spools of this. Price wise, it's a little bit more expensive than PLA, but not much. About five bucks a spool more, I think. So and then I made this cute little guy. Everybody makes one of these. This is this little octopus with the little tentacles that are real flexible. And he is cute. Look at that. Look at those little tentacles. Now, the thing was, this was an experiment as well because I didn't know how well he was going to print because this is what they call a print in place. It means all of this is done together. It's not, I didn't have to put individual links together or anything. And when you take it off the printer bread bed, these little things articulate. They're, they're like that. They, I don't know how it does it. I mean, it's not the printer that's doing this. Okay. It's whoever designed this and they call it a model. And they were able to d design these little links so that when you took it off, it does just what you see right here and just pop bang. There it is. So I might, make a larger one just to see how well that works out and i might try making it in something like this um what do you do with this anything you want <laughs> wear it on your head wear it on your shoulder i don't know have it sit on something it's just fun but that's what i've said you've heard me say it before 3d printing is a toy it's for fun yeah some will try to tell you that you can make a lot of practical things for around the house with it yeah to a certain degree but Mostly people are making toys from what I've seen. Okay, so, um, yep, that's all I've got for the 3D printer corner. So that takes us to part five of the fabric sculpture. So I've got out my texture paste, or actually it's a molding paste, and I've got out a stencil, a Tim Holtz stencil. And I've got out over here some metallic gold paint. And what I want to do is just put up here in this one corner just a very light kind of textured um, look. I have an idea, which I'll tell you about later, um, that I want to do with this, that I think this would be the appropriate little touch to the background. Now, I've got my modeling paste, and I haven't used this in some time. But it seems to be okay. So I'm going to put some out here on my craft sheet. And I want to mix a little bit of white paint in with this. Even though this is white, um, I just want to brighten it a little bit. So I'm just going to use some fluid acrylics. Hmm, don't have that much left of that. And I'm just going to blend it in to the paste and you can do this with uh, any color and with pretty much any paint uh, at all to basically taint, tint your um, modeling paste or texture paste or whatever kind of paste you're using 
Now, do, let's see. Okay, that doesn't look too bad at all. And I'm wondering if I should put any more, maybe a little up here, just on the edge. There, that's all I'm going to add to that. I've got a lot of this left over, but that's often the way, but that's okay. And so I'm going to let that dry and i got to clean this up. But now I've got these metallic paints right here. And I haven't used these in a long time, but they don't seem to have dried up. So I gave that a little quick stir just before I started to record. So that's mixed up. And now I'm just going to take my brush and I just want to go kind of in one direction just lightly over the edges. Oh, I'm liking that. Now, I don't want to get too carried away here. But I am most certainly liking that. Okay, let's stop while I'm ahead. All right, so I'm going to let that dry. And that's now, what's that, about layer three or four? I'm losing count of my layers right now. But I have an idea, as I said, for something on here. And I'm going to do it out of fabric. And, well, you'll have to just wait and see what that is. We're getting close to the end of that series. I think there's one more part, maybe two more parts uh, in that. And then I'm gonna start a new project, which actually I already have done. And, well, I'm not gonna tell you any more about it. You'll have to wait and see. Okay, so events in the past week. Update on my mother, she's fine. Those marks from her face plant are going away slowly. But last week when I talked to her on FaceTime, uh, it was looking much better. Um, and she's in about the usual spirits. So yeah, nothing more to say about it. She's fine. Okay, so uh, last Monday, after I did last Monday's vlog, Walter and I went over to Ultimate Sewing. Ultimate Sewing is closed on Mondays. So we met up with Donna. Uh, we're all wearing our masks and everything because we made a video about Ultimate Sewing, the store and the products they have and everything like that. And that, I've made that for the retreat and it went off really well. Um, Donna, who is, uh, I call her the hostess with the mostess, she did an excellent job. She said she was nervous in the whole bit. You would never have known that. What a professional. She should have her own television station, YouTube channel. I suggest that to her. You know, you should have a YouTube channel, Donna. Be, she says, no, 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 I can't get up in front of people and do those kind of things. <laughs> you just did. But anyways, that's going to show on the retreat, and I'm really pleased with the way it turned out. And I might uh, put it up after the retreat uh, as a special bonus video on the Idiot Quilter section of my channel. Uh, but that won't happen until after the retreat, because this is for the retreat. Um... We did craft and chat last week. Always do craft and chat, as you know, on the first Wednesday. Uh, we had a few new people on there. We're not a huge group right now. I think we were up to about 10 of us, 11 of us, something like that. Very enjoyable time. Everybody is just so nice and everybody's working on their projects and they're so creative. And it was just really, really pleasant. Um, even after this COVID thing is under control whenever, whatever decade that will be in. Um, I think I will carry on with craft and chats because I enjoy them. And it's all about me, isn't it? Um, I enjoy them. The other people on there seem to enjoy them. So, you know, watch for uh, the announcement of the next one. The next one will be the first Wednesday in April. And 
think about if you're able to to join us i know it's during the day some people are still working um i forget about that as a retired person but if you're not and you want to join us then watch for the announcement of it but it was a lot of fun and actually i'm using the craft and chat as sort of a model into the way that i will run the retreat as well the retreat will be a little bit more involved but I'm using the same kind of thing. It's just an informal atmosphere of people getting together, doing what they love to do, chit-chatting, having a good time. Okay, so I also had a meeting of my art journal group. Uh, everything happens at the first of the month for me because uh, the Craft and Chat is the first Wednesday and the art journal group meets the first Sunday of every month. And we had a demo of a product on that, which was good by one of our members. Um, and if you're interested in the art journaling uh, group as well, we are a group of people that have been, there's about 10 of us. We've been together for the most part for four years. Um, we used to meet physically once a month and work on our stuff. Now we share our stuff and products and ideas and stuff like that through Zoom. And um, that's working out very well. Uh, great group of, of people. I was going to say great group of ladies because I'm the only man so far um, with the group. But if you are interested in it and joining us, you are more than welcome to. Um, just send me an email and let me know because then I will explain to you in more detail uh, the procedure for that because it is a little bit more of a, um, it's not, it's still informal. Uh, but, well, it's just that we've all been together for so long we know each other and you know you bring in somebody new and though everybody there with, with open arms would welcome anybody into the group as a new person coming in you might feel a little bit you know uncomfortable which we don't want you to feel uncomfortable but if you're interested send me an email you can also see what it's like because i post them i do record it with everybody's permission and i do so because it gives everybody it's a, very inspiring because of the different things people are working on and have to show. So I post those on my channel. The one from yesterday is up there already. You can check it out and see what the atmosphere is like if you're interested. Okay, uh, so we do have a Wally Cooks. This week, I'm gonna put the video in here in a moment. Wally Cooks, no chicken, butter chicken. Mm -hmm. You'll find out why. And he did teriyaki pork chops. So I'm gonna put those in here right now. Okay, so Wally's cooking again, but this night, this night we're going vegan. And we're cooking stuff out of a jar. It's stuff out of a jar. And this looks like vomit. And this looks like vomit. And it's sort of a butter chicken kind of thing out of a jar, except we're not using any chicken. We're using What's this stuff called? Paneer. paneer. Paneer, which is an Indian cheesy kind of thing. It sort of reminds you of tofu. Kind of like rubber. White yeah, rubber. Kind of white rubber. Uh, we've tried it fried and making it into sakanaki, but yeah, it worked, but it didn't work. And so now we're trying this butter, no chicken kind of thing and vegetable uh, korma. And... Uh, yeah, I don't know what's going to be like, but what the heck. And I'm also cooking. I'm making something I haven't made in many, many years. And we found a couple of boxes of this stuff in our cupboard, which I don't know when it expired, but I think it was best before in last century. So I'm trying to make it anyways. And you do it in the microwave and it's basically a form of pudding. Um, I like these box puddings. I've eaten them for years, but I haven't had it for a long time, as I said. And so you just pop it in the microwave after you mix it up in the bowl with warm water and two pouches that it comes with and an egg. And uh, yeah, in about five to seven minutes, we see what we get. So here's the final product. We have no chicken, butter chicken. We have vegetable korma and rice. There is no meat in this. So I guess we're eating vegan. Unless there's eggs in the nan. I don't know if there is. Now, I wonder what Wally's cooking now. He's got something in the sous vide. Some sort of meat. Looks like he's got some kind of sauce on it too. We shall find out. Okay, so 
in this mystery meal that Walter's making. Yeah, it's a mystery because I still haven't figured out what I'm doing yet. You see, I told you. So he has <laughs> mushrooms and he has butter. And then over here, he has something boiling and he has the rice out. Well, the rice is out, but it's going back in. Now, what do we have in the sous vide? We have pork chops. In teriyaki pork chops. Teriyaki pork chops. It's my recipe for teriyaki, by the way. Right now it looks like slimy pork chops, but they were thick cut pork chops. Uh, these got in here, so boneless. And we're serving it with mushroom rice. Anything else? I'm not sure yet. Probably have sure. a little bit of soya. Probably, I don't know what else I put in there, but yeah. Maybe a little green onion. Well, I meant what else with the meal. I don't know yet. I was oh. thinking I could do, uh, I could do uh, um, some broccoli or some other kind some of vegetable. Some broccoli. How long have we had that broccoli in the fridge? It's been there for a week or so. Well, we probably should eat that. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's what's for dinner tonight with Wally Cooks. I'll show you the end result if I remember. So, here's the final product. Are you pleased? Yes, I am oh, so pleased. So, these are the teriyaki pork chops, boneless. Uh, mushroom rice. And the broccoli with some cheese sauce. And some more of Wally's famous homemade bread in a basket. Which are which are end pieces, but... Oh, it's end pieces. Okay, so we're eating pieces. So that's what's for dinner tonight. And I see that my wine glass is empty, so I have to do something about that. Now, I have to be honest. Both those dishes were not complete successes. The uh, no chicken butter chicken with the um, paneer cheese... Now, it's like eating tofu. Now, if you like tofu, you'd probably like it, but I'm not a fan of tofu. But we tried it. It was squeaky. You bite into it and it goes squeaky. Uh, you know what I mean? That kind of texture. And the teriyaki pork chops, well, those didn't work out so much. They were actually, they were kind of on the dry side, which I found surprising because he did them in the sous vide. But the pork itself, I don't know, that cut of meat that we had was a little porky. Yes, I know, pork is supposed to taste like pork, but I mean, you know what I mean, uh, a little bit strong in the pork background, and I don't like that. So, yeah, they were a valent try, but no, <laughs> didn't work out as well. Okay, so what's coming up? Nothing. <laughs> yeah, nothing. I mean, I guess I'm going to get my blood taken at some point this week. Wow, there's excitement. Um, yeah, nothing else standing out there. Um, so, oh yeah, there is one event. Um, we have a birthday party to go to, virtually. Um, some very good friends of mine that have been friends of mine since childhood. In fact, they live next door to my grandmother and that will be one of my grandmother's stories in a future video. Uh, but their father is turning 90 I think he's turning 90 and we've been invited to celebrate his birthday uh, tomorrow night, Tuesday night, um, via Zoom. So I don't know what we're going to do, but we're going to celebrate his birthday. And so that'll be interesting. That'll be the first time I've done a birthday party via Zoom. Actually, I haven't done any birthday parties of any sort since COVID, of course, but this will be interesting. It'll be fun. So that's something to look forward to. Oh, I'm getting my hair cut again. Yeah, I know I don't actually need it cut because she cut it so short, short last time, but I always, I'm a creature of habit. I get my hair cut every three weeks when we could. Um, and I can this time, so I have an appointment tomorrow for that. And yeah. And I don't know, I may be coming home later this week with a new toy. But that's something I'm going to be discussing on th this week's Idiot Quilter. We'll see. So if you're interested, check out the Idiot Quilter late tomorrow. Okay, so I think that's about it. Oh yes, the retreat. We've had more prizes donated. Um, we have 
20 gift certificates from Ultimate Sewing and we now have 15 gift certificates from Class Act. Class Act is my local scrapbooking store, crafting store and Carol, the owner there, has generously donated 15 gift certificates for her store. And uh, Kim of the Quilters Way Chatterbox Quilts, she has, uh, uh, she's working on some special things for her online uh, classes and store as well. So it's all coming together. Lots of fabulous prizes. It's going to be fun. Now what I have to do is send out an email to the participants uh, about some things and we're getting closer to the date. It's March the 20th. Uh, it is full. So if you were thinking about signing up for it, well, you can't. <laughs> Sorry, I'm full. However, I do have a waiting list set up and I have had a few people cancel out and I have taken people from the waiting list and put them on. Um, so, I mean, there's you can still get on the waiting list. No guarantees whether you're going to get a spot this time. But, um, you know, if you want to sit on the waiting list, by all means, send me an email, let me know. Okay, I think that's it for me today. Thanks for watching. And uh, we'll see you on the Idiot Quilter tomorrow. And we'll see you on Sunday for Stephen and Walter Live. Okay, so stay happy, stay healthy, stay in. This thing isn't over yet. Um, and have a really good week. Bye-bye for now.